Science is primarily about observation and trying to make sense of what you observe. And over the past few years, I have been following closely abnormal patterns about blood clotting that embalmers have been seeing. As I had done multiple interviews, I spoke with a whistleblower who was seeing it in live patients. I've spoken to a doctor who has seen it post-mortem, and I've spoken to embalmers who are also seeing the same patterns. What's even more concerning is they are still seeing it. And there doesn't seem to be much focus on what is going on and why this is occurring. From my perspective, as I continue to try and understand some of the immune mechanisms that occur on reinfection, this fits with what I expect to continue to occur. And this is why I'd warn the scientific community, this is not going away. And to reflect carefully on what we can do about it in the near future. This paper, autoimmune hemolytic anemia in COVID-19 um, patients, is one that has recently been published in, um, well, it's coming up in, in August of 2025, but it's available for us to, to look at. And it's talking about the fact that they have reviewed multiple cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia associated with COVID-19, a rare but serious condition. Essentially, autoimmune means that the immune system is targeting red blood cells it's causing them to be destroyed. That's the hemolytic. So they are bursting open and releasing free hemoglobin. And because of that, their blood counts are falling. That's the anemia. And they have found it can be associated with COVID-19. Now, they've called it rare, but essentially what it means is that it can occur and therefore it could be occurring subclinically at a different level. And so this is now very relevant with what I've been looking at in terms of trying to understand the patterns with the embalmer's clots. Now, I've interviewed Richard Hirschman, who was the first person to raise the alarm in 2021. He's an embalmer from the United States. And I've spoken to him a few times, and I've gotten details on the protein characteristics of these abnormal clots. If you want to learn more about what I've been talking about, there is a free course in the description below that you can join on. Here is a short bit where he was speaking with John Campbell about some of these abnormal patterns that he had noticed since 2021. first saw these clots early 2021, March or April time 2021. Have you ever seen anything like these white clots before in your entire 23-year career? No, John, I haven't. And uh, I remember the kind of the earlier times of when I first saw it, I, I was shocked and I just, you know, kind of overlooked it as a strange anomaly. Um, but when I started seeing it more and more often as the year went along, I started asking other embalmers and, and professionals that I work around and with, had they ever seen it? Some of these people had up to, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of experience, and uh, none of them had uh, witnessed these types of clots either. And so, as I said, this is important. And Richard Hirschman is still saying that he is seeing these clots in up to 50% of embalming uh, in bodies that he is embalming at the moment. Now, you may think that this is still an isolated thing, but the person who really pushed this to the front was Tom Haviland, a retired major U.S. Army. And he was doing the simple research of just asking the question. And very recently on this substack here, he was invited to speak to the Tennessee Funeral Directors Association. And this is where he was sharing recently on June 8th. And this is um, the picture of Tom Haviland, Worldwide Embalmer Clot Survey, highlighting the fact that this has been going on and is being noted across the world. I hope to speak to Tom again soon. 
and highlight, I guess, the critical bits of information that he's been doing and raising awareness about the science of it. What I want to do now is explain a little bit more in terms of what I think is the science. The first step is, are they making it up? No. Hundreds of embalmers have said the same thing. They have not seen this before. Now, there are some embalmers who don't acknowledge that it's occurring, and that's fine. But for the ones who are seeing it, there needs to be a logical, scientific explanation. And this is the bit that we need to try and understand. Now, I'm going to show you some slides and some of the details with regards to the protein characteristics of these clots that helped me to come up with an idea tied with this principle of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So let's follow along and see if this makes sense to you. That's Richard Hirschman, and that's a picture of him holding a 19-inch clot in this tube. The first thing you must notice, not only is it quite large, but it's white. It's not, as he said, grape or dark as we would expect with a normal clot. And this is an important piece of the puzzle, because as you will see, when we look at the protein characteristics of the clot, you would expect that it would look typical to a normal clot, which is dark because there is so much blood associated with it. But we have four cases that they had sent to have protein examinations for. And in this one was a teenager. And what I wanted to notice simply, very quickly, in red is the hemoglobin beta subunit. Just remember that the majority of the proteins in this one were hemoglobin beta subunits. When we look at a 25 year old, the most was fibrinogen, but again, hemoglobin subunit beta. Observe as well that there is not a balance between the number or the amount of hemoglobin beta and hemoglobin subunit alpha. This is it here. It's like a three to one ratio. Remember that. That's important as we continue to work through it. This is someone 40 years old. Again, the primary characteristic or the primary um, protein in it is hemoglobin subunit beta. And again, you can see alpha is not equal. Again, that's important. And again, here in a 70-year-old, most of the protein is fibrinogen. But again, you can see here hemoglobin subunit beta. And again, it's about a 3 to 1 ratio with the alpha. And you'll understand this a little bit more as we go along. And when you put them all together, when we look at hemoglobin beta all through, it is one of the most consistent parts of this abnormal clot. But it raises the question, why is it white? And this is an important piece of the puzzle. Now, again, taking you back to the science. And when they compared it with all the cases here, again, you can see that the most consistent abnormality is the hemoglobin subunit beta. The total amount of it is significantly higher overall than fibrinogen and significantly higher than hemoglobin subunit alpha. And that's this one here, 15. 71. Now, this is quite important when we are actually thinking about mechanisms as to what could be happening with this. The first thing I'd want to do here is show you what happens with regards to a normal red blood cell. On the left here, you have a red blood cell, and you have millions of these in your body. On the right here, you have a hemoglobin molecule. It's important to note that it has two alpha and two beta chains. And so you would then wonder, how is it possible that if there is free hemoglobin, there is not equal amounts of alpha and beta? That's a very important point. And for each red blood cell, there are about 20, 270 million hemoglobin molecules in one cell. That's a lot of hemoglobin. The question then becomes, what is going on in the context of these abnormal clots 
that would cause hemoglobin to accumulate? Well, when you understand that a part of the spike protein combines with free hemoglobin, and more specifically with the beta chain. Here I've got the spike protein binding to the beta chain. This is from a paper, SARS-CoV-2 proteins bind to hemoglobin and its metabolites. This is from 2021. So we know that it binds quite closely with the hemoglobin, but it seems to bind more strongly to the beta chain than it does to the alpha chain. And this is very, very important. Because now, just because of that paper that I'd shown you, suddenly the pieces are starting to come together. If I'd missed this, this is what I was looking at right at the start. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia in COVID-19 patients. It's just 105 cases that they were looking at across the world. In order to understand it, autoimmune means that the immune system is targeting something. And in this case, it's the red blood cell. This is why it's hemolytic. It causes the red blood cell to burst open and release free hemoglobin. And they are anemic because they have lost the amount of controlled hemoglobin in the bloodstream inside a red blood cell. And so this is what can happen in COVID-19 uh, patients. This fits perfectly with what I had been talking about previously with regards to an immune-mediated storm. And this is a critical part of what I have been explaining is the reason that I think these abnormal clots form so quickly. To put it in context, because many people are worried, oh my goodness, do you have clots walking around with you all the time? Based on what I've observed, based on the science, it seems very unlikely. Angiograms and ultrasounds, and we don't typically see these clots. Who is finding them are one, embalmers, which means that people die after they have these big clots, which is likely because they are so big. Additionally, the other people who may see them or people who are operating in catheter labs to remove big clots in very sick patients. Critically, the doctor that I had spoken to, he highlighted that for the patient that he found the clot, which is almost a foot long, on autopsy, the patient had been fine four days before. And what that indicates to me is that this process occurs very, very quickly. And so when we put it together, and this was what I'd done from the, the uh, free course, if you want it, there are a number of characteristics. Netosis, in fact, I think it's not really just neutrophil, but macrophage netosis. The spike protein combining with heparan sulfate to include platelets, which activates them and causes the clot to form faster and free hemoglobin rather than red blood cells because it's the heme group which is the um which binds the oxygen that changes the color this is just the protein which would mean that it wouldn't change its color to being dark this is important stuff because without an understanding as to what is going on one we will therefore leave patients without any opportunity for intervention or mitigation. Because we need to understand what are the characteristics? What are the mechanisms? Why does it occur? My prediction is that it occurs on re-exposure in a patient who has been immune primed. So meaning that that's my typical description of the COVID storm. It's not just the fact that somebody has, say, been vaccinated or they've had a previous infection. It's when the two things come together after their immune system has been primed that causes this explosion in terms of that concept. And if you don't quite understand, I've got a whole image here that um, I'd want you to look at. I'll add it here. This is the typical picture that I have of the COVID storm. Recurring infection in a vaccine, in primed 
population triggers autoimmune responses, which could include hemolytic anemia, netosis, fibrin um, binding to spike protein, and the combination then creates a product that doesn't happen on its own with one or the other. That's the principle of the COVID storm. It's like epoxy. If you take one of the epoxy tubes and you try and stick something, it doesn't work. If you try the other one, it still doesn't work. It's the combination that causes the disease characteristics. This is why we're at such an important transition because many people continue to underestimate infection. Based on the science, and I will continue to explore this over the next few weeks and months, based on the science, if you have immune-primed people or populations that get exposed on a regular basis to what seems to be a mild infection, they can present within probably weeks to a month with very strange patterns in the context of their disease. That's the concern, that's the storm, that's what I'm trying to understand, and that's what I think can explain some of these really abnormal embalmers clots. Follow the science, look in the description, get the free course, let's continue to explore it together. Have a great evening.